So welcome everybody to this online uh, webinar on Turkish foreign policy in the Levant. Um, I think we'll get started without further ado. My name is Urban van Veen and I work as a researcher with the Klingendaal Institute where I uh, facilitate a small team that uh, researches uh, conflicts throughout the Levant and I will be very privileged to be hosting this webinar for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, what I would like to do is briefly take you through the purpose of the uh, webinar, uh, the wonderful cast of speakers that we have assembled and the program and some practicalities, all of that in just five minutes. And then of course we will turn to our speakers and I'll explain you in more detail how we shall do this. The purpose of our panel essentially is to develop a better understanding of uh, Turkish foreign policy writ large. Uh, a lot has been happening recently um, we see quite a lot of what you could call militarized diplomacy emerging out of Turkey recently, and certainly the establishment of some kind of Turkish near abroad with the respective Turkish interventions in Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, recently Azerbaijan, and some maneuvering in the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean. So what should we make of this? What are the risks, the opportunities, uh, and perhaps the threats that come with this, uh, shall we say, more assertive Turkish posture? And how do domestic developments link with Turkish foreign policy is always a critical question. Uh, reference the recent arrest of a number of HDP mayors in Turkey itself, but also developments like the recently concluded Sinjar agreement in Iraq. And of course, to top it all off, the recent European Council meeting was quite ambivalent on Turkey, uh, choosing not to pursue uh, too much of a hard line and rather accommodating some of the recent uh, Turkish maneuvering with some diplomatic language. Now, these are complex issues. For today, we will focus on Turkish policy in the Levant. So specifically for this webinar, that means uh, Idlib and Syria the relation with Iran and the Turkish approach towards the Kurdish issue across the region. We had to pick a few topics and we felt that these commanded sufficient interest to dedicate our webinar to. Now, I'm very happy that we have a really excellent uh, cast of experts who've joined us for the occasion. Um, I will make brief introductions um, and you can read more about them and of them online, of course. So first of all, we have Salim Sevic at the uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, who is an astute observer of Turkish domestic politics, uh, but also will share with us his insights on the situation in Idlib and especially the Salafist linkages that connect the two. Then secondly, uh, Maisan Beravesh at the University of Lund, uh, who is an astute observer of the relation between Turkey and Iran, among many other things Iranian. Um, then, third of all, Mohamed Kanfash, who will share with us a perspective from Syria, so to speak, on Turkish foreign policy, um, since we have seen four major Turkish military operations taking place on Syrian soil with different purposes and to different effects. Uh, then we have in our midst Hamza al-Shadidi, who joins us from Suleymaniyah in Iraq, um, who will also provide us with a perspective, but this time, of course, from the Iraqi end of things where there has been a lot of complex maneuvering um, by Turkey with both the KDP, the PKK and the PUK. So the different Kurdish parties that um, run Northern Iraq, so to speak. And last but not least, we have Engin Yuxel, um, who is with the team um, at Klingendal here and who will shed some light on the Turkish approach towards the Kurdish issue. Um, where we have also seen quite some major developments since the peace talks broke down with the AKP in 2015. So that's our cast of speakers. The way we will run this conversation um, is that we will have three short introductions um, by Salim, Engin and Maisam on their respective topics. So that's Idlib, the Kurds and Iran for shorthand reference. After which we will turn um, in particular to Mohammed and Hamza, uh, but also our original three speakers in a more expert-based conversation, if you like. The aim of that is to you know, drill down on a couple of particular points and also to give you a kind of menu uh, of takeaways from the entire conversation. 
you are of course at liberty uh, and I would even encourage you to put any questions you might have in the Q&A function, uh, which is at the bottom of the screen. Just type them up, I'll keep a close eye to it and weave these questions into the conversation as we proceed. Then there are a couple of practicalities to finish off with. Um, if you're not speaking, if you could kindly mute yourself, that would be much appreciated. Please bear in mind that the session is recorded um, and that I will be relatively strict on time management because these webinars are always most fun when we all stick to the time. If we finish sooner, that's fine, but we should not finish later and test the patience of our listeners too much. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, shut up and turn to Engin for a first intervention. Engin, it would be really wonderful if you could enlighten us over the next sort of seven minutes on the Turkish approach towards the Kurdish issue with a few you know, points of attention, uh, perhaps you know, the radical shift uh, by the Turkish government from negotiating with the PKK until 2015 to fighting it tooth and nail across the region. What have been the main elements of this strategy? And, you know, is it ultimately a sustainable strategy? What can we say about the long-term long effects uh, that are already to some extent on the horizon? And Gin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erwin. Um, as you said, the 2015 Soviet market change in Turkish foreign policy from a political to a security approach to the Kurdish issue. And I think Leading up to 2015, a combination of internal and uh, external developments played some roles in the failure of the AKP's peace process. It was very visible that a stalemate occurred at some point on the internal issues, uh, such as the PKK's refusal to disarm on the one hand, and Turkish government's unwillingness to allow for Kurdish language education in state schools on the other. But uh, one uh, other important issue was at play from 2015 onwards, the emergence of three Kurdish administrated regions in, in Northern Syria behind the scenes shifted the course of discussions from internal to external. Uh, Ankara, Ankara insisted that the, there could be no second Kurdish protectorate in, in Syria after the Kurdish and regional governance in Iraq on the other side, uh, Öcalan saw Syria as the new red line. This is because Syria could be an important opportunity for the PKK to change its illegal uh, standing by establishing an internationally recognized entity thanks to the, its partnership with the United States against Islamic State. Um, Insight, the, the results of June 2015 elections also changed AKP's perception towards the Kurdish People's Democratic Party, uh, HDP. When, when the HDP won 13% 13 of the votes, it entered parliament and uh, delivered the blow to AKP's parliamentary majority. And this Kurdish political challenge canceled out the AKP's remaining willingness to solve the Kurdish issue in coordination with the HDP. And, and this challenge promoted the emergence of an anti-Kurdish alliance in Ankara with inclusion of National Sikh Movement Party and, and the AK, AKP. Since then, Ankara has been looking to the Kurdish issue through the lenses of security and nationalism. I think this was the main drivers of, the, these were the main drivers of the change. And I think from this moment onwards, that the Turkish government has resorted to old school policies such as repression of Kurdish movements and, and cooptation with like-minded Kurds inside and outside in the in the similar manner, and the, the repression dimension was very visible since August 2015, especially when PKK's acts overshadowed HDP's political achievements. Um, yeah, you do the HDP's political gains on the one hand, and PYD's Kobane separate uh, emboldened PKK to undermine Turkish authority in Kurdish cities by use of its the outwink and social networks. And also this is followed by the declaration of autonomy in, in, to, in about 20 cities by the HTP mayors. And this local uprising gave Ankara a timely excuse to crack down on the Kurdish political movement by associating the HTP representatives with the PKK. This is followed by the political arrests, 
emergency powers, curfews, and intense military operations, including the disproportionate use of military force. Um, at the regional domain, uh, anti-Kurdish card um, has offered Ankara uh, several opportunities to realize its long-standing ambition to fill the, the power vacuum um, in its near abroad. And this ambition has been realized by the strategy of preventive intervention. Uh, this strategy sees cross-border operations in Syria and Iraq, not as hot pursuits, but as permanent tools of maintaining stability without the request and consent of respecting governments. Uh, therefore, the anti-Kurdish -anti card has helped Turkey to establish areas under effective Turkish control, both in, in Syria and as well as in Iraq. Um, the, 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 the second plank of uh, the Turkish strategy is based on cooptation, which seeks to capitalize on existing uh, ideological, um, uh, religious and, and tribal differences between Kurds. In summary, Ankara uh, seeks to tolerate Barzani-inspired Kurdish movements and terrorize the Öcalan-inspired Kurdish movements. And, and this rift uh, laid the baseline of Turkey's broad approach to Kurdish movements in Turkey, Syria, and in Iraq. Um, if, if I assess the effectiveness of this approach, uh, the, the, the implementation of repression and co-optation in a broader scale has turned the Kurdish question from a largely domestic internal Turkish issue uh, into a regional factor of instability. This is primarily due to the fact that neither of these approaches uh, aim to and are capable enough to solve the deep-rooted Kurdish issue. Rather, these approaches are useful to consolidate the AKP rule inside and expand Turkish influence outside. So it's more instrumental. Uh, Ankara has now controlled some stretch of territory in Northern Syria and Iraq and exhausted the PKK and PYD there by use of military force. However, Ankara is not winning the war at the diplomatic front for several reasons. First, PYD has attempted to compensate for its tactical losses by launching a wide political campaign. And uh, Erbil and Baghdad are growing increasingly concerned over Turkish military operations in, the, in, in Iraq. Uh, inside Turkey, uh, Turkish operations uh, has one more time crippled the PKK. However, it has done nothing to, re to radicalize the Kurdish nationalistic movements. And uh, for me, the, 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 the political movements should be the only chance for the peaceful resolution of conflict, other than the repression against the HDP is strengthening the PKK's voice within the Kurdish communities, which advocates for violence. So we can say that the relentless use of anti-terrorist frame uh, feature many sticks, and, but no comprises, such as the improvement of uh, collective minor rights. I stop here. Thank you very much, Enrin. That was most instructive. 2015 as a turning point, uh, in part due to the rise of the PYD, resulting in a broad regionalized and militarized, we can add, a strategy that looks like achieving some short-term successes, but, um, you know, sort of generating a lot of long-term grievances, uh, potentially. Thanks very much. We will get back to some of these issues. Um, Salim, might I turn to you for the uh, sort of Idlib stroke Salafist dimension and specifically it's interesting that Turkey works or at least tolerates a number of Salafist oriented groups in Idlib despite the fact that Turkey itself of course has very little by way of um, Salafist current and is traditionally more moderate in the Sufi Brotherhood uh, camp. So if you could share with us some, some ideas on, you know, what is allowing for this connection to happen and where do you see it going in terms of both end state and potential risks, that would be much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm, I will talk about two separate phenomena and then we'll see if, it is, if there is any connection between them. Uh, as you mentioned, Salafism is is a newcomer to the Turkish religious scene. Uh, a, a recent survey by a Turkish think tank found that 3.6% of Turkish society is affiliated with Salafism. This is not a major force, but it's not also entirely negligible. Uh, more importantly, the same survey four years ago found the number at 1.2%. So in the time of four years, it tripled. 
And if we had the opportunity to, to reach data of 10 years, 15 years ago, we would observe that Salafis were almost non-existent. So we are talking about a recently emerging and rapidly rising phenomena here. And uh, at this stage, I might I feel this to make a caveat here because when I talk about rise of Salafism, spread of Salafism, it sometimes sounds like as if I'm talking about the disease or something. That's not the case. The majority of the Salafis are quite peaceful and law-abiding people. It has become conventionally on the research on Salafism to divide Salafism into three categories, quietists, political Salafis, and the jihadi Salafis. And, and it's the last category that that is a problem of violence. And as I will try to point out when I, when I come to it, there are even shades of jihadism. I, I will come to that as well. Now, uh, the spread of Salafism started in uh, as a reaction, actually, a Saudi policy as a reaction to the Iranian revolution, but uh, it didn't, Salafis couldn't manage to make inroads to Turkish society back in 80s and 90s, but after, only after 2010s. There are uh, several reasons for that. I briefly mentioned them. One of them is uh, what I call the crisis of the religious scene in Turkey. There are several manifestations of that, uh, that crisis of that religious ecosystem. Uh, Salafism is only one of them. Uh, this crisis is about, uh, can be summarized as the fact that uh, Islamic inspired government is ruling for the last 20 years creates uh, discredit, discrediting effects. It creates disillusionment, but also it carries uh, Islamists from opposition to power. So it makes them, rather than uh, being an anti-system force, makes them a pro-system force and carries them from periphery to the center of the political system, which means that uh, there are no representation of anti-systemic feelings within the established religious tradition in Turkey anymore. And finally, the uh, co-optation and loss of autonomy of the religious movements and institutions by the AKP regime is the most important uh, aspect of it. I believe it's very, very crucial, but I will not go into the detail, maybe in the Q&A if anybody uh, wonders about it. And then the dim external dimension is obviously the Syrian crisis, uh, the porous borders, freely moving uh, recruiters, uh, militants, uh, moving back and forth between both sides of the borders and let them to create structures and organizations on the Turkish side of the border created and contributed to this new phenomena of rising Salafi jihadism in the Turkish society. And all these questions came into the Idlib crisis and crystallized and materialized in there. I think there is a, a large scale consensus on the future of Idlib nowadays. Uh, since the events of last year, everybody expects that Idlib will become a form of a Gaza Strip in Syria. The regime will control M4 and M5. It's already controlling M5, but it will also secure the M4 entirely. And to the north of the M4, uh, there will be a, a, something similar to a Gaza Strip, overcrowded, uh, very uh, unstable but also sustainable uh, because it works to the interests of basically all powers in, involved in the conflict. It, it works into the interest of Russians to keep uh, some rebel held areas uh, to, to use as a leverage against the regime. It, it, it works to the interests of the European Union as well because nobody wants further migration. Uh, it, it even works to the regime itself because uh, frankly speaking, uh, the demographically, the, the challenge of assimilating three, four million people uh, back to the Syrian territories proper is, 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 a, is a huge task that regime is at this stage at least not willing to take as long as it secures the strategic locations, the, the, the M4 highway. And uh, it's important for Turkey because for two reasons. One is, of course, uh, Turkey wants to use this region as a buffer to prevent further migration, but it also gives Turkey strategic depth inside Syria. Uh, Turkish officials believe that if Turkish involvement in Idlib uh, is not sustained, then attention will move into the three other regions that Turkey is controlling uh, in the northern and northeastern Syria uh, in order to prevent the formation of a Kurdish corridor there. Uh, so th they consider Idlib as a, as an ex as a buffer zone to prevent uh, attacks on, on its uh, other regions like uh, Al Afrin and uh, uh, and others and other 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 places. Uh, 
And the problem in, in this uh, equation where everybody is happy, the burden of maintaining and keeping the jihadists under control, the burden of maintaining that they will not spoil this agreement uh, is falls on the shoulders of Turkey. Uh, and uh, that's basically this, the argument in the Sochi uh, agreement that the separating of radicals from the moderates, that's, that's, the, that's the terminology used, but in reality that means Turkey is responsible for keeping this, the jihadists under control to prevent uh, them creating further security threats to the Russians, to the regime and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, for many years, many people, including myself, questioned the sustainability of this project. We all wondered what will Turkey do with thousands of jihadists next in its border. Turkey is now pursuing a novel approach to this. I don't know if it will work or not. Uh, it's basically not uh, taking care of HTS itself, but it is letting HTS to take care of itself. Uh, and I'm here, I'm meaning that it's Turkey is expecting a transformation of HTS from a jihadist Salafi and uh, Al Qaeda style jihadist Salafi to a, what you could call kind of a Taliban style jihadism. So there are shades of jihadist movements, and instead of uh, pursuing a global jihadist and uncompromising uh, policy, uh, Turkey is hoping that HTS will move more pragmatically, uh, will limit itself to its territorial uh, territorial controlled areas. Uh, and HTS itself will take care of the other hardliners. Uh, so Turkey will not uh, get its hands dirty. So uh, in a way, Russia delegated the issue to Turkey and Turkey has delegated it to HTS to Ge to, to, or to Jolani to be more precise, the pragmatic uh, dimension of the HTS. So far, uh, HTS had been successful in controlling those radical elements or suppressing those radical, the more radical elements. Uh, but uh, the crucial turning point in this event was March 5th, 5th agreement between Russia and Turkey. Up to that point, in that relationship, HTS was the upper hand. But uh, last year in February and March, it became clear that uh, the survival of HTS is dependent upon Turkish protection, which changed the table. And now Turkey holds the upper hand and can push HTS uh, in line with its agenda. It will probably not be able to assimilate uh, HTS into its uh, SNA, the Syrian National Army, but it will manage to keep HTS under control or so far at least it had been. Uh, I'm wrapping it up. Uh, the radical LM, there is always, uh, in this scenario, there's always the risk that the more radical function, Hura Sadin and others, and also radical functions within HTS will not accept this, uh, this bargain and they might create a military conflict. Uh, by attacking Turkey, but also uh, they might also create a problem by uh, using their strike back capability within Turkish territories. Uh, and that's where the domestic and the international dimensions get connected. Uh, if those of you who follow Turkish politics, domestic politics would not notice that there had been increased debates on whether Salafis in Turkey are getting militarized and acquiring weapons in the last couple of weeks, thanks to the remarks of a famous televangelist. Uh, I am considering, and here I'm being fully speculative, I know, but uh, I'm considering this debate as a preemptive attempt by Turkish security officials as a warning to those radical elements. In, if uh, a military confrontation in Idlib requires between Turkey and other uh, uh, non-comprising jihadist elements. The Turkish security officials is sending a, a message to the domestic Salafis not to take sides and not to get involved into that conflict. Here I'm stopping. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Salim. That is very insightful as, uh, as always. Um, I especially think your analogy sort of from, uh, what did you say, Al-Qaeda to the Taliban is a memorable one because it sort of reduces the complexity of the issue to one sentence. Now, how pragmatic the Taliban have become remains to be seen, I think, but at yes. least it's a, it's a hopeful thought in a sense. Um, on the Gaza comparison that is quite popular these days, um, I'm sure you didn't mean to say that Gaza is sustainable because that is um, is clearly not the case. But I hope yes. that Turkey at least would apply a more um, human, uh, shall we say, uh, form of border control than either the Israelis or the Egyptians uh, do in Gaza at the moment. 
So thank you so much. I think we will get back to some of that uh, too and very perceptive on uh, sort of the cascade of delegation from Russia to Turkey to HTS in terms of the strategy. Thank you. So let's turn to eastwards to Iran then uh, with Maisam who we have in our company. Um, there's been quite a lot of uh, developments on the Turkish-Iranian relationship, I would say. And I would be very appreciative if you could share your views with us on, you know, things like what are the key drivers of that relationship? Uh, you know, to what extent is this strategic and to what extent is it pragmatic in terms of the sanction regime that has been imposed on Iran by the US? And, you know, how compatible are some of these issues really? You know, for example, the PKK and the PYD that are such a major issue for Turkey, but have traditionally been more of Iran's allies, shall we say, or at least partners to some extent. Over to you, Maisam. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you uh, very much for having me here. Uh, I think uh, both speakers uh, kind of uh, let the groundwork or foundations of what I'm uh, going to talk about. Um, Engin and talked about the um, the, the rise of state nationalism, special folks on the PKK and uh, Salim talked about uh, Islamism to some extent uh, as kind of uh, practiced or uh, promoted by, uh, by Turkey. Uh, and these two uh, issues, nationalism and Islamism, uh, basically form um, the, uh, the basis of uh, uh, Iranian-Turkish uh, uh, rivalry in the region. So uh, basically the relationship, I think, uh, on a uh, grand uh, level, uh, on a strategic uh, scale, is uh, one of uh, rivalry. This has been mostly the case, uh, particularly on the uh, AKP and um, after Trump came to power uh, in the course of the Syrian civil war. Uh, and Basically, when we are talking about Iranian Turkish rivalry in the region, uh, we are talking about two uh, competing uh, regional uh, visions and orders. On the one hand, you've got uh, nationalist uh, pan Iranism on the uh, society side and strategic depths and acts of resistance on the state side. So, this is the Iranian. Uh, um, uh, uh, way of basically projecting itself in the region. On the other hand, or basically ordering the regional uh, power dynamics, on the other hand, you've got this Islamist nationalist no Ottomanism, um, basically uh, pursued and promoted by um, AKP. Uh, but, but so this rivalry, uh, which is based on two competing uh, regional orders or visions, is uh, quite arrested. So I would personally define the Iranian-Turkish uh, relationship kind of in the course of history, let's say a recent history in particular, as arrested rivalry. So it is, it is a rivalrous, but it is arrested because uh, these two neighbours with uh, over 500 kilometer shared border are too much intertwined uh, to, and too much interdependent uh, to be able to sustain open hostility or to, uh, in order for the hostility to remain uh, sustainable. And uh, the Kurdish issue is one of these uh, areas of, uh, uh, you know, um, collaboration that makes the rivalry quite arrested. You know, you've got also, uh, the uh, vast, uh, 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 basically the vast uh, volume of uh, interaction between uh, both sides in terms of uh, Iranians uh, investing in Turkey or Turkish uh, uh, the, the traders uh, being very much present inside Iran, even though under Trump, the volume of trade between the bilateral volume of trade has uh, dropped very seriously. So Turkey is no longer Iran's, um, let's say, escape valve when it comes to uh, American sanctions. It's now on the Trump and you know, the, in the past couple of years, it has shifted to Iraq. Under Obama, when like AKP was in power in Turkey, uh, it was mostly Turkey that was operating as, uh, as a uh, clearinghouse or somehow as a facilitator uh, 
uh, of um, Iran's uh, financial relation with the outside world. But now it is mostly Iraq. So Iran is relying on Iraq to uh, to uh, stave off the uh, the effect, um, the, the impact of uh, sanctions. Then it comes to the Kurdish question. Uh, there is strategic cooperation between them, but there are tactical issues as well, particularly in Syria and North well, East Syria, where Iran has at times tried to leverage the Kurdish issue and uh, the, the, the collaboration or relations between SDF and uh, the Assad uh, government uh, against Turkey, you know, to basically secure concessions or establish its presence there. And there are also reports that Iran's uh, famed land corridor from Tehran to Beirut or to the Mediterranean was supposed to go like through the northern part of Syria, but um, basically but was later moved, reconsidered, moved to the southern part. Now it is going through that uh, line border there, um, like the, there, uh, the United States also uh, has uh, quite a, a considerable military presence. Uh, so th there are uh, th there is the uh, relation with the United States on both sides, and that affects Iranian uh, Turkish ties. There is a Kurdish question, and also uh, as I as uh, Salim uh, to some extent mentioned, there is the um, uh, the Syrian factor, where uh, Turkey's efforts to um, kind of entrench itself or um, create some sort of statelet in Idlib is uh, causing uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, tension because neither uh, the Assad government nor Iran uh, are likely to compromise on the status uh, of uh, Idlib in the long run. You know, we, we already know very clearly what happened to uh, the um, Jolan Heights. It was occupied and then uh, turned into a reality on the ground. Uh, as part of now Israeli territory, as recognized by Trump administration at least. I don't think uh, that historical trauma uh, like uh, Syria, Damascus, will let that historical trauma kind of repeat itself in the case of Idlib. And it's a very strategic uh, enclave or location. Uh, that would be uh, my uh, very uh, brief introduction or basically the theoretical or conceptual framework that uh, uh, based on this idea of arrested uh, rivalry. I will stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Maisam. And you're very right to point out to us, I think, two very important things. The historical trauma of the Golan is a potential benchmark for sort of the thought process of the Syrian regime. Uh, we had difficulty inviting them to this call, obviously, but it would be uh, good to test that at some point. That's a very perceptive point. And of course, the place of Iraq in the current, um, shall we say, as a safety valve for the, uh, for the Iranian economy, especially at the informal level, um, mm -hmm. is well known. And that is actually a very nice bridge to transit uh, from what you just said to Iraq and to Hamza in particular. I mean, Engin, you have described um, the increased Turkish activity uh, in northern Iraq. You've also made it very clear that this activity is no longer uh, in the hot pursuit category, but has actually seen the creation of about two dozen Turkish military bases on Iraqi soil, an uh, ever-increasing number of airstrikes uh, by drones or F-16s or other means. And then what is remarkable, uh, and for this I turn to you, Hamza, if you could be so kind, is that the response of both Baghdad and Erbil, so the central government of Iraq and the Kurdish uh, regional government, has been fairly muted, uh, right? There have been the occasional declaration of protests, there has been the occasional conversation with the Turkish ambassador, no doubt, but not much beyond that. Hamza, why is this the case in your opinion? Um, thank you very much for having me, Erwin. Thanks to everyone who spoke before me as well. Um, I, I want to start by saying that neither Iraq nor the Kurdistan region are actually in a position to agitate Turkey or to confront Turkey, keeping in mind, of course, what Engin has said, that Turkish uh, policy is becoming increasingly aggressive in the region. Um, I will cover economics, um, you know, politics and security um, as briefly as I can. But economically, Iraq is a country that's almost entirely dependent on imports. Iraq cannot maintain food security without imports. 
And Turkey is one of Iraq's largest trading partners and the provider of many of the necessity goods that Iraq needs. Um, Erbil also maintains very strong economic ties with Ankara. Turkey has the largest uh, share of foreign businesses and companies in the Kurdistan region. Thousands of companies more than the second, which is Iran, um, notably in the field of construction, but also potentially in the field of gas and oil in the future. And uh, the relationship between Ankara and Erbil has warmed recently following a tense period um, after the Kurdish independence referendum. Um, so Turkey remains a very important partner for uh, trade partner for Iraq, but also a strategic partner for the Kurdistan region, especially shall things go south with Baghdad because uh, with the Kurdistan region squeezed in a very tense environment with Iran to its east and Syria to its west, the only viable options or partners of cooperation are actually Baghdad and, uh, and Ankara. Um, and Turkey remains to this day, the only channel through which Iraq could export oil, if it's going to happen, if this is going to resume to the Mediterranean. Uh, there are talks of a pipeline with Jordan, but this has not materialized yet. As, but most importantly, when it comes to economics, I would say that uh, Turkey holds the keys to the lifeline in Iraq, which is the Tigris and the Euphrates. And we have seen the amount of damage a dry up uh, or that could cause during the summer of the Tigris and the Euphrates in Iraq. We have seen mm -hmm. it in 2018 and the effects on Basra, poisoning of hundreds of thousands of civilians because of shortages of fresh water. Politically, I would say that the increasing increasingly fragmented landscape also means that Iraq um, as a state, as a government, really lacks a clear foreign policy objectives. Uh, in Iraq, political parties and figures conduct their, you know, uh, their interests uh, domestically and abroad independently without any regard to the central government in Baghdad. And I here mean all actors, not naming mm -hmm. any. Uh, Baghdad and Erbil also have quite diverging interests as well when it comes to foreign policy that they have not been able to bridge uh, this gap, at least domestically. So the result is there is no foreign policy uh, for the federal government in Iraq. Whatever promises that the federal government gives are hardly translatable domestically, and they it's really hard for the government to keep up with all the promises uh, it gives. Um, it, it basically lacks any, any meaning. This, mean, this actually makes dealing with Iraq really challenging for neighboring states uh, and, and allies. And Ankara has realized this and quite learned the lesson. It knows well that it doesn't need Baghdad's approval to carry out its objectives in Iraq. Um, Baghdad's approval is quite unnecessary at this point. Uh, in terms of security, if military confrontation is ever an option, which I think it's not, uh, we don't have a central command structure in Iraq. The federal government doesn't really control all the forces under its umbrella. And I think uh, the attacks on uh, the diplomatic missions in Baghdad and the situation in Sinjar, which I will uh, return to later, uh, quite illustrate that quite well. Um, um, and... and <clears throat> Coordination and communication between the various and the several Iraqi security forces in Iraq remains quite weak uh, as well. And whatever capable forces that Iraq has um, are quite smaller in size and overstretched for their capabilities. Um, so, you know, in a way, Iraq is not in a position to confront uh, Turkey in a military uh, battle in any way or shape. I think it's for these reasons that Iraqi and the Kurdish response to Turkish aggression has been uh, feeble because, you know, Iraq realizes uh, the constraints and the hindrances on itself and Iraq doesn't really stand on equal footing with Turkey. Um, and that's also something we should keep in, in mind. It cannot confront it. It cannot find a way to stop the attacks, uh, domestically at least. It cannot address Turkish, uh, Turkish national uh, concerns. And it cannot kick uh, Turkish troops out of the country either. The only option is a long-term uh, strategic dialogue with Turkey. But considering the domestic realities in Iraq, uh, this uh, option is uh, becoming out of reach uh, every day. Uh, and uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hamza. Um, that was a pretty impressive overview of uh, dependencies, which I think is the thrust of your argument in combination with the fragmentation of the central Iraqi political system that will make it very hard to mobilize any kind of response. Very perceptive point also on the lack of uh, foreign policy 
uh, you know, or a meaningful foreign policy in Iraq, which also makes me think about Lebanon, for example, which shares some similarities in this regard with, uh, with Iraq. So, um, Engin, let me turn to you. But before I do that, uh, to our audience, if you have any questions in the meantime, don't hesitate to write these up in the Q&A and I will try to do my best to pick them up uh, as I can. Engin, you've spoken about the Turkish interventions in Northern Iraq, and we've just heard a lot from Hamza on independencies, on dependencies, I'm sorry. So how far do you think Turkey will push this let's say feebleness on the part of Baghdad and, and Erbil. And is this end goal of, you know, chasing the PKK all the way out of the Kandil mountains actually feasible from a, from a military perspective? Could you be so kind as to share a few thoughts on this? Of course, Erwin, um, as mentioned by Hamza, the, 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 the Iraqis, Iraq's um, internal problems gives Ankara a free hand to exert the military power in northern Iraq, but what, what is the limit? That, that is the main question mark, as you perfectly mentioned. In light of the formal statements, I can, I can say that the purpose of Turkish operations in northern Iraq is to undermine the PKK presence in both in, in the areas close to the border area and also in, in, in Kandil Mountains. Um, but despite the political statements, I see a decisive ground operation against Kandil less likely due to the geography and, and, and distance, and most importantly, the, the Barzani's unwillingness to fight against the PKK. Um, the, the, as a result of this, this um, Ankara has controlled a stretch of territory on the Iraqi side of the border uh, and, and, and targeted the uh, um, uh, critical locations uh, in Kandil by indirect means, such as the air strikes and drones. So kind of an indirect strategy because of the, these limitations. In any case, it is unfeasible to destroy the PKK, even if Turkey managed to expand its, its operations to Kandil. This is mostly because the controlling an area by armed forces and killing terrorists remain incapable to solve the broad issue of terrorism. The PKK is alive inside Turkey, even though Turkish army um, uses the same approach inside for about 40 years. Uh, and for this reason, um, Turkey's approach uh, has ignored the population dimension and failed to reduce the local support for the PKK. I think this is very important. Um, but, but I see another driver of Turkish presence in Northern Iraq. And I'd like to draw your attention to, uh, to this by use of a map, if I can manage to share screen it. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, can you see the map now? It's great, go right ahead. Okay, uh, this map shows Turkish military presence in Northern Iraq, uh, published by the, the Directorate of Communications. Um, as a really recent map, and this, this map shows Turkey's undeclared goals. Uh, for me, Turkey's undeclared goals could be to establish a permanent presence in, in the territory along the Turkish Iraqi border. If you adjoin the, 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 the about 40 military bases in the Northern Iraq, as seen in the map, uh, that, that could ensure the formation of a safe zone or de facto safe zone, which is uh, similar to what we, what we see in, in, in Northern Syria. So that could be an undeclared goal of uh, pursuing operations in Northern Iraq, as long as the PKK threat consists and as long as uh, Iraq has internal issues. Wonderful, that's clear uh, and again, very helpful map too. So what we could be seeing is basically a buffer zone uh, that develops across a lot of Turkey's southern border, including uh, large segments of Syria, as well as segments of Iraq, uh, could be more formal in the case of Syria and less formal in the case of Iraq, presumably. So thank you. And I, I don't want to miss on your, your critical point that even if the PKK would be defeated in the Kandil Mountains somehow, uh, that still would not resolve the issue because of the failure to resolve it domestically in Turkey. That's, uh, I think, a critical point. So, but maybe to spin that out a little further, uh, Maisam, if we were to think about, you know, sort of another Turkish push against the PKK and there's some sort of idea that this group can physically be eliminated, 
So all the way into the Kandil Mountains, getting very close to Iranian territory and certainly trespassing on the territory of the PUK that is linked to Iran uh, in many different ways. Would Iran accept this or do you think it would start working against it through the PUK and by supporting the PKK? Well, I don't think it would um, kind of respond by uh, supporting the PKK kind of directly uh, or um, in uh, like or PKK's other allies inside Iran. But I think uh, Iran uh, anyway would not uh, uh, tolerate that uh, basically because it sees that uh, it, it would see that move uh, as it does uh, Turkish intervention in the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, now conflict. As, uh, as an attempt at uh, ex expansionism. So uh, but basically as a, as a Turkish attempt to expand its influence in an area which Iran somehow considers its own backyard, its own kind of strategic or security backyard. And now this is exactly the problem with the, uh, with the uh, Armenia uh, Azerbaijan conflict. Very closely Iranian border and Turkey is uh, basically transferring um, it's allied Syrian uh, militant, uh, militant groups. Uh, a similar dynamic uh, would be the case, uh, or as perceived by Iran, um, if uh, Turkey pushes uh, too hard into uh, the Iraqi or uh, uh, Kurdish uh, territory in northern Iraq, uh, close to the Iranian borders. Uh, the fact is that these, uh, both, I mean, uh, both Iran and Turkey have been uh, cooperating on the Kurdish question in terms of uh, reining in, containing, or kind of targeting, uh, no PKK or uh, PUK targets, uh, kind of positions. Uh, but then there is a very fine line um, in, in terms of how uh, this is uh, perceived by Iran like uh, whether it is a, a coordinated uh, collaboration uh, to, uh, to take on a common enemy or it is more of an excuse that is used by uh, Turkey to expand its uh, uh, like uh, the, the scope of its operations. Um, and particularly in northern Syria, that has been a quite um, no, a bone of contention, uh, let us say. And Turkey's relationship with Iran kind of, um, no, gradually shifted after the Syrian war uh, uh, in Iraq. So uh, under Obama, the, Turkey was very much a part of the negotiations to, uh, to de-escalate tension between Iran and the US uh, over the uh, nuclear program. I mean, in May 2010, there was even a declaration which, uh, in uh, Turkey, which uh, um, like the Obama administration ignored. Okay, and Lula da Silva, the Brazilian, former Brazilian president, Erdogan and uh, Iran's Ahmadinejad, they were all in Turkey uh, trying to come to some sort of solution. Uh, so uh, I do see that uh, cooperation. I'm not uh, losing sight of that uh, uh, collaboration, uh, but uh, th th this is a very uh, kind of uh, fluid and uh, kind of sensitive uh, dynamic uh, how the uh, the foreign policy moves of each side is uh, uh, perceived uh, in the uh, in the other uh, capital. Iran, I think, would not tolerate that much um, uh, that much uh, advance into uh, it is own um, a kind of uh, a backyard. Mm. Even though both sides are see, I mean, have uh, share this uh, common kind of threat perception uh, with respect to. Uh, uh, to the uh, like uh, the Kurdish groups, as uh, Turkey would not tolerate Iranian support for SDF, or basically even if uh, even if uh, like it is aimed at uh, kind of consolidating Assad's rule in Syria. So you've got that kind of. Thank you, Wysam. That's, uh, that's clear. I think the challenge that we will be facing is that the backyards of Iran and Turkey show some overlap. Yep. And that is precisely in this particular area. So, um, so thanks for your take on that. That um, it's a good warning. So you mentioned the SDF and the PYD, which is good because that brings us to Syria. So we can tune in uh, with Mohammed. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting for so long, but thank you for um, for joining us on this um, 
webinar. I would like to talk a little bit more to talk about ITLIP to pick up on some of the points that Salim uh, thoughtfully raised uh, and specifically on the Turkish presence in ITLIP because from the outside, it looks like a bit, a bit of a mixed bag, right? On the one hand, uh, the Turkish military presence uh, you know, protects a lot of people against much worse. We've all seen the offensives of uh, Assad and company. They're not pretty. Um, on the other hand, you might also argue that the Turkish presence uh, prolongs the conflict and you know keeps a lot of people sort of in a uh, very difficult situation, despite all the humanitarian aid that Turkey, of course, allows across the border. So I was wondering, could you share with us a little bit, um, you know, how do you see the balance in the end from a, from a let's say, we'll say a Syrian perspective to people who find themselves in that territory that you work so much with? Good afternoon. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's been uh, most instructive listening to uh, all the uh, fellow uh, panelists. Let me start by a quick reiteration of what you, Erwin, said about the, the comparison between Idlib and Gaza. I totally agree with Erwin. The, the situation is entirely different in the sense that although the Syrian army has committed horrendous crimes, its ranks and files uh, have done really horrible stuff, not only in Idlib, but across the country. It remains a national uh, institution, and hopefully at one day the, the whole population will be able to look at it that way. In Idlib, it's an entirely different, it's an occupation force. Having uh, quickly answered that, now going back to the question, I do think that uh, in terms of protection and the humanitarian situation, if I was to guess that the Turkish policymaker definitely thinks of think of that when it comes to Idlib. However, this is not what it keeps the, the Turks uh, awake at night. The, 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 Turk, the Turkish policymakers have, I believe, strategic interest in the region. Number one, preventing any new uh, refugee wave, allowing the return of refugees from Turkey to Turkish-controlled areas in Syria, securing a seat in a future uh, discussion on the S Syrian solution. And four, which is the most important, is leveraging Northwest Syria with Northeast Syria. The Turks, the Syrians, and the, the, the Russians are engaged in several uh, negotiations over more or less giving up areas for areas. The, the last six months, there has been a talk about Turkey taking over Terrafat and Membej in return of Turkey giving up other areas south of Idlib, for example. This has not worked uh, quite uh, smoothly as uh, people would have expected because the Syrian Damascus is looking uh, to take both areas, but this is to, to be expected in the, in, in the north. While a few years ago, if you ask people in Idlib, how do you see the Turkish involvement, the, the majority would have thought of it as the savior. However, the reality is setting in right now across uh, opposition uh, members, uh, civil society, that Turkey is in Idlib for its own strategic interest, taking into consideration the humanitarian needs of the population. However, because it, Turkey has given up or made some concessions, People understand very well that when cornered, Turkey is not going to be uh, be there for them. This is something that they've seen in Aleppo, for example. This is something that they've seen in other areas close to Idlib. That really helps, uh, Mohammed. And not to put you on the spot, but would it be correct to sort of to paraphrase that by saying that Turkey regards Idlib as a kind of bargaining chip? It. I don't want to take the humanitarian aspect out of the out of the whole situation. Turkey does. The, the Erdogan has made it its its own call from the beginning. We will not allow another hammer. And I do believe that Turkish policymakers and a part, a big part of the Turkish uh, population, do care about the the the, uh, the Syrians in Italy. So, but it is eventually going to be used as a bar uh, bargaining chip. Okay, no, that's well noted. And I think we should make note of the fact that, you know, Turkey is subject to a lot of criticism recently for various foreign policy moves. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but it's the only entity that has uh, engaged in any sort of protective action in Idlib, uh, both in the military and in the humanitarian sense. So it's it's kind of you to flag that because that often goes unnoticed, uh, I think, or gets snowed under the barrage of criticism uh, in the West in particular. Uh, Engin, if I turn to you for the same question, uh, you know, is Turkey going to uh, keep hold of Idlib? Uh, what would you say from the sort of the other analytical end of the spectrum? You're a mute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, Erwin, I see Idrib. Um, yes, I agree with Mohammed's perception, the, 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 um, the bargaining chip. But I think for Turkey, Idlib, Idlib is more than a bargaining chip because the, in, in Ankara's thinking, the loss of Idlib may endanger the Turkish gains achieved during the Fratis Shield and Olive Branch in Afrin, in, in Albab and Jaraplus. So it endangers the, the very idea of safe zone. Um, and on the other side, the loss of Idlib may trigger, as mentioned by Mohammed, the massive refugee flow in direction to Turkey. And therefore, uh, uh, in the midterm, Turkey wants to integrate the, the north of M4 and M5 into its safe zone without the need to deploy a huge amount of forces, uh, military force. Um, at the moment, um, Ankara utilizes its military power. Uh, uh, predominantly to deter uh, Russia and Syrian regime to relaunch a massive offensive, uh, and 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 also these these military deterrents serve the purpose of uh, um, having an upper hand against the Hayat Tahrir al Sham because uh, HTS has a government there and Turkey wants to um, show its its deterrence to to convince the the pragmatic wing to accept the rules and terms of, of Turkish approach. Uh, so uh, overall, we can say that Turkey is buying time uh, by, by use of military deterrence. But I think that the overall aim could be to integrate the, this Idlib into its safe zone and administer the area by Turkish backed groups under its effective control. Excellent, excellent, thank you. It strikes me that these two positions could be compatible in time, right? Like it could be a short term approach to sort of the military build up to deter further regime offensive to protect the civilians in the area and to, you know, allow for any type of negotiations to get started, especially since the Assad regime has shown itself to be particularly opposed to any kind of negotiation and it said from the beginning uh, of the war that it wants every square centimeter of Syria back under its control. Um, so it probably will have to be um, massaged into any kind of concession uh, by the Russians in particular, which could then in the longer term uh, give Idlib more of a bargaining chip uh, status. With all due respect to everything that's happening there, the you know the word may sound a bit offensive. I just uh, don't have a better term that comes to mind right now. Um, so that is that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, one final issue as we enter the final sort of 15 minutes of our call: the status of uh, of northeast Syria, which is currently under control of the uh, PYD, sort of the dominant Kurdish party, at least in the military sense. Um, you may know, or we all know, that there are talks underway between the PYD and the KNC, which is an alternative grouping of Kurdish political parties that are not presently uh, in control of northeast Syria, but also have a lot of support. And this is in part under US sponsorship and also under sponsorship of the KDP, the party of uh, Barzani in the uh, northwest, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So Hamza, I mean, I wonder whether I could turn to you for a few thoughts on the uh, KDP interests in Northeast Syria. Uh, it's clear what the Turks want, it's clear what the PYD wants, uh, but what does the KDP want in your opinion? Um, thank you so much for this excellent question, Arwin. I think before um, diving into the subject and just linking it to um, what I uh, said about Ibil having its own foreign policy, it's uh, important to say that Ibil has long sought to position itself as a capable and a trusted ally for the United States in the region. Even during the current embassy crisis between Baghdad and DC and Erbil opening its arms to uh, welcome any relocation of the diplomatic mission to, to Erbil. So thus uh, sponsoring the uh, talks between the Kurdish National Council and the QID in Syria um, kills uh, two birds in one stone. It reaffirms the strategic relationship between the United States and Erbil and shows that Erbil is able 
um, to help the U.S. in such a, an increasingly tense environment. But it also helps Arabia to advance its interest in inside Syria. Uh, as we all recall, the Kurdish National Council, uh, the establishment of the council was sponsored by the KRG, uh, mainly by former uh, President Masoud Barzani. So seeing its influence eroding in Northeast Syria over time is quite unpleasant and problematic for um, Erbil. Uh, sponsoring these talks might allow Erbil an upper hand to help the KNC regain its seat on the table in Northeast Syria somehow. And by extension, of course, prevent the uh, KDP's adversary, the PKK, from dominating the narrative, the political narrative in, um, in Northeast Syria. But the KDP's or the KRG's interest uh, in Northeast Syria also go beyond Syria, because whatever happens in Northeast Syria also has an impact on uh, Iraq, especially the border region betwe between Syria and, uh, and Iraq. Uh, if if these talks are successful, this will help to the KRG to settle issues that are much closer to home inside Iraq on the Turkish borders and the disputed territories, um, uh, specifically in Sinjar. The situation in Sinjar has become much more complicated than the one in Kirkuk. Because in Sinjar, you have militias with ties to actors in North East Syria with the PKK, and these militias don't listen or don't respond to the commands of Erbil or neither to the commands of uh, Baghdad as well. In Kirkuk, for example, the still despite our problems, uh, Kurdish parties could return to the table with uh, actors from the South and the middle who are all together in the same political process. They meet in Baghdad and this is the Iraqi political process, but it's much harder to do this uh, in, in Sinjar. Um, the KRG also has long indicated um, as a response to the uh, Turkish airstrikes that it will never allow the PKK or any actor to use its territory to launch attacks on any neighboring nation. And that, of course, uh, includes uh, Turkey. So in increasing uh, KRG's influence uh, in, in Northeast Syria, through increasing, by extension, of course, the influence of the KNC might help uh, the KRG to actually implement the recent deal between Baghdad and Erbil to uh, uh, to co-administer uh, Sinjar and to kick out unwanted groups out of the, uh, of the area, um, to at least cooperate with the Yazidi factions that are still open to uh, negotiations with Baghdad and Erbil, uh, help the KRG control the portion of the border, its portion of the border with Syria, stops the intrusions of unwanted groups into the Iraqi Kurdistan region. So I think it goes hand in hand. Uh, interest in Northeast Syria goes hand in hand with KRG interests inside Iraq. Uh, they're the objectives of the Iraqi Kurdistan region as an entity for Iraqi Kurds within, within Iraq. Yeah, uh, very thoughtful, Hamza. And interestingly, I found an email in uh, my inbox this morning from the KCK, sort of an umbrella forum linked to the PKK. Uh, denouncing the Erbil agreement uh, or the Sinjar agreement, I should say, for lack of consultation with the local communities, uh, which may or may not be true, but we should bear in mind that there is a close link also between the YBS and the, the sort of the, the, the forces in Sinjar, the local forces in Sinjar and the uh, PKK. Uh, that to a large extent in the past has been very positive because it saved a lot of Yazidis from the uh, march, the advent of the Islamic State, of course. So as so many things, their double-edged swords and achievements in the past are no longer necessarily positive in the future. So thank you, Hamza. Um, Mohammed, if, if we look at this more from a Syrian perspective, you know, there have been plenty of talks uh, between the PYD and the KNC before, of course, uh, several Erbil agreements, the Duhok agreement, etc. It's never gotten to anything um, for various reasons. Um, could you enlighten us why this time might be different or you think it will be the same dead end as usual? Well, I would caution um, not to be over optimistic about the current round of negotiation. This is something that this is, uh, first of all, not the first time that the two parties sit together and negotiate over more or less the same topic again and again. The, uh, right now, what we have is something that, if I want to make analogies, is when the U.S. forced the Iraqi opposition to, to form 
one particular front against the the the, uh, the Saddam Hussein before 2003. But after a while, when the U.S. pressure to, went away, the, the the front fell apart. The the KNC and BYD differ on all major points in terms of uh, in ter uh, when it comes to governance, when it comes to how to the relationship with Damascus, the relationship with the region, Turkey, UAE, uh, Iran, and the like. And most importantly, they differ about who is in control on the ground. The main questions that were not addressed in 2011 are still until today uh, not addressed. And from people on the ground, the, the, uh, I have to say, it doesn't seem uh, very uh, promising. The KNC has everything to win if this uh, agreement uh, sees light, but the YBD has everything to lose. Mm. So I, I don't see it as something that will have a future in the... Uh, in the uh, it, it's not gonna have a future. And something that sh I can't stress enough, the role of other spoilers in the region. I know we tend to, to think of the uh, of the Syrian state or the Syrian regime as insignificant when we talk about regional actors in terms of Russia, Iran, and, and uh, Turkey. But the Syrian state has its own apparatus in the region, has its own connection through the Arab tribes, through various other Kurdish entities within the region. And they are still able, even if an agreement has been reached, to somehow at the level of the implementation to stop or at least to hinder the full implementation of the agreement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I would like to pursue that a little further, but we have a few questions in the Q&A that I wouldn't mind uh, picking up as we go along because they're really good ones. So thank you. Um, I think we have one question that I will answer straight away myself, whether the Turkish military drive across the region, so the various offensives that we have just discussed in Iraq and Syria, whether it's merely sort of security motivated or whether it could also be conquest motivated. Well, here I would offer that we've heard from Engin that they might very well be aiming to combine both in the form of a buffer zone, sort of a safe zone along the southern Turkish border. Uh, that is meant, of course, to buffer Turkey from any Kurdish militant attacks. Um, and that will take the place, the, the shape of uh, permanently conquered uh, territories, if you like. So we're talking here about the Operation uh, Peace Spring area, for example, in Syria, the Operation Euphrates uh, Shield and the Operation Olive Branch. Uh, these were all directly related to the, um, to the rise of the PYD. So that's maybe a quick answer to that. Um, one more question I will pass on to Mohammed, uh, if you could be so kind, um, which is basically what is your take on, um, you know, sort of the game plan of the Syrian regime in Northwest Syria? It relates to your point of it potentially being a bargaining chip, uh, but how do you feel about sort of the short term M4, M5 and what will likely happen beyond that? Could you share with us any insight you might have in, in the motivation there? Well, I think that the Syrian regime has made it quite clear that they are adamant to, to take back all of uh, all of Idlib region. The, the, um, and like the, the, it's undoubtedly, the, uh, as Ingen said, uh, Ingen said, that Turkey might want to keep the region, but the regime has different plans for the area. First of all, Idlib has become a national cause, and that is helped by the presence of terrorist groups, as well as groups that are irrelevant in terms of their uh, national program or because of their overt cooperation with Turkey. So for the rest of Syria, Idlib has become, it's no longer a question of opposition and, uh, and regime, but for quite a big segment of the, the population for Damascus itself, this is a national cause, exactly as Mason said, they're not gonna leave uh, Idlib to become a new Golan Heights. Uh, the, the Damascus, unlike Ankara, is not politically uh, accountable. So I think they are willing to, to invest or to, to, to allow thousands of people to die for this particular uh, uh, last battle, uh, let's say. 
uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that Turkey is leaving tomorrow. We, we see actually today as we speak, one of the observation points, one of the observation posts within regime held areas are being evacuated. This is an operation that is going to, I believe, is going to be slow. Turkey might try to, to maintain some presence where there is a Turkmen concentration. However, that will be tricky because that will be a catch-22. Is, the, is a Turkish intervention in Syria motivated by a, a ban-Islamist uh, uh, intervention or is this a, an ethnic intervention to maintain Turkish held areas? But I do believe that in the, in the short term, and I think I would put around June 2021, because it's around that time when the Syrian regime and Russia might be able to block the, the, the entry of humanitarian assistance to Idlib. So far, Turkey has been able to maintain, Gaza, uh, to, to maintain, uh, <laughs> to maintain Idlib simply because it's cheap, let's say. The bill is being paid by the UN. The most of the uh, assistance is coming from the international uh, community. If next uh, halfway 2021, Turkey has to maintain its army, but 4 million people in a post-corona time, uh, this is something that I would highly question. So my question, my answer is to, to make it short, I think we're going to see um, a gradual return of the area. It's although it's going to be a bit painful, but uh, this is the plan of the Syrian government. Very insightful. Uh, Salim, I think you wanted to come in, but I can only give you one minute. <laughs> Uh, my point would be that it is not the regime that is calling the shots, nor the Turkey itself. It's, as we all know, it's the Russians that are calling the shots at the moment. And the solution it will be related to the larger Turkish-Russian relations that develops in multiple fronts in Azerbaijan, Libya, East Med. So it is one element in this larger bargaining scheme and its outcome will be dictated by, uh, its fate is very much dependent on the outcome of Turkish-Russian relations in other fronts. Well, I thought we sort of had the issues more or less sorted, but I see now that we have to do a follow-up uh, webinar. No, I'm kidding, uh, Salim. That's a very insightful point, and we, we haven't really discussed the Russian angle, of course. So, so thanks for flagging that. Next time, we should get some of our Russian friends uh, on board. Uh, one more question that I got all the way from Iran, which is about sort of the... Um, you know, foreign interference in the different Kurdish controlled areas across the Middle East, uh, you know, what about it? So thank you for that question. And it, it will be the last one to pick up because we're approaching uh, quarter past. Um, I think it's inevitable um, that if, given, given the fragmented nature of this, both the Syrian civil war and all the parties involved as well as, as, well as the sort of governance system of Iraq, that the different uh, shall we say, representative parties and armed groups associated with different parts of the Kurdish community will inevitably be exposed to all sorts of courtships by foreign powers, uh, to some extent invited themselves, uh, just as a way to keep standing. But the picture is quite diverse, of course, where the US cooperates closely with the PYD and the SDF. Uh, the PKK is on the official terrorist list of the United States. Uh, the PUK has always been closer to Iran, as has the PKK. At the same time, the Americans just threatened to, you know, close shop in Baghdad altogether and potentially move their embassy to Erbil, which could, if that happens, which, you know, we'll have to wait until the US elections have taken place, could result in a sort of, you know, US protectorate, I uh, dare to say, uh, that combines Northeast Syria with uh, Northwest uh, Iraq. Uh, potentially uh, to some extent tied to Israel even, which also has some informal relations with some of these players. So it's hard to say, but I think we can uh, safely arrive at the conclusion that a lot more uh, proxy activity is going to, to happen in sort of the Kurdish controlled areas of Syria uh, and Iraq, and that Turkey and Iran will weave that into their own strategies uh, inevitably as a matter of course. So I think um, that is us basically for this webinar, um, respecting everybody's time. There are two things for me left to do. Uh, one is to thank all of you for these extremely insightful comments. 
we will uh, make the recording of this available uh, so that we can all uh, benefit from it once more, circulate it, uh, make reference to it, uh, these sort of things. So uh, heartfelt thank you. Um, and then a quick preview, because uh, there were a few questions also from the audience on sort of Turkish EU relations and Turkish NATO relations that I have not answered. Um, I am remiss for that, but my apology is that we will organize two more webinars this year uh, on precisely those dimensions of Turkish foreign policy. So one will still follow on Turkish EU relationships and one on Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is very closely tied to the NATO question, uh, given the NATO membership of Greece uh, and some other issues. So that's a promise. Um, if you keep following the Klingenau newsletter, they will be announced uh, soon enough. And I will obviously also put them on Twitter. So with that, I would like to thank you once more and uh, wish everybody a wonderful remainder of the afternoon. Yes.